All right. Um, well, we can go ahead and get started. So I'll be your moderator today. My name is Laurel, and our guest speaker is Sumita. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'll give you a quick little uh, introduction to our speaker, but just as a reminder, this is a webinar on um, behalf of our Socioeconomic Inequalities Special Interest Group, or ISBNPA. Sumita is the Chief Inclusion Officer with Inclusive Creation. She works closely on building new partnerships and developing current programs. With her int international experience in public, private, and civil society sectors, Sumita brings with her a, over a decade's worth of experience in public relations, diversity counseling, and co-creation of accessible policies. She's also worked on developing inclusive policies in emerging markets through corporate partnerships and supported international civil society organizations in replicating their innovative programs. In the past, Sumita has led national level working groups and policy matters regarding marginalized communities, and she led Singapore's first ever parallel report committee for the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Having published papers for the Universal Periodic Review, Gender Equality Reports, Position Statements for Policy and Legislative Issues in Singapore and Wider Asian Region, and Research on Military Conflict Policies, Sumita enjoys finding new areas of growth to ensure that barriers can continue to be broken at every level. So for today, Sumita is our speaker, and if you have questions along the way, feel free to put them in the chat, and we will have time throughout for questions as well. Take it away, Sumita. Perfect. Thank you so much, Laurel. And I see we've got a small, very cozy group here today, so feel free to jump in, ask questions anytime at all. Um, how today is going to be kind of structured is very flexible. Um, I'll start off with sort of a, a, a bit of a I don't want to call it a lecture but more sharing my thoughts and ideas about what I think universal design is in my in my line of work and then um, if we have time depending depending on how the how the session goes we'll have a little bit of an activity towards the end and then we'll call it a wrap up so we started a little bit late so I'm going to keep an eye on time but Laurel just let me know when we have about 10 minutes towards the end that'll be great just so I can open it up for Q&A or any comments or any thoughts like that uh, towards the end if that's okay. That sounds great. Uh, thank you. So um, first, I'm just going to share my, oh, um, I can't seem to share my screen. It's a source disabled participant screen sharing. Would I be able to share my screen, please? Yes. Let me just see this one. No worries. OK, it should work right now. And Laurel, Perfect. can you just please confirm? Oh, sorry. I see. I only give permission to Laurel. That's why. So it's, 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 <laughs> no worries. <laughs> no problem at all. Um, can everyone see my screen okay? Does it look okay uh, on full screen? Perfect. Right. So just by way of introduction, th thank you so much, Laurel, for that amazing introduction. Uh, yes, I am the Chief Inclusion Officer with uh, Inclusive Creation. Uh, we are an Oslo-based company. Um, but I myself am currently based in Vienna in Austria. So it's a very rather international group that we have here today, I think. Um, so happy to do a little bit of an introduction, um, just so I know where we're all dialing in from, and that way I can make uh, this a little bit more curated and customized for everybody. So I'm from, I'm originally from Singapore, living in Vienna right now and working for uh, a Norwegian company. So that's as international as I get but happy to uh, throw it to the rest of the participants that we have in the room today. Just a very quick one, two line as about where you are from, what you hope to get out of this um, out of this session and also the, the kind of field work that, that you're working on. Sure, I can go first and then I can throw it to Mary. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm Laurel. I'm from Texas in the United States, actually. I'm a PhD student in health education. Go okay. ahead, Mary. Hi, I'm Mary Hurst. I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota, and I'm actually working on a grant um, that's based in Ethiopia and oh. um, I'm looking at uh, implementation science, and I'm interested in applying what I learned today with this grant. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, next one, we have Nikita. You turned on your camera at the right time, so I'm going to pick on you. Hi, uh, I'm Nikita. I'm from the Netherlands, and mm -hmm. I'm currently working as a junior researcher at the Amsterdam UMC. It's uh, the hospital, the medical center. Okay. And uh, yeah, I'm involved in two projects now uh, in cultural diversity. Mm -hmm. And in June, I will start a PhD. And uh, yeah, I hope to include some diversity and inclusion in there as well. So that's why I'm joining today. 
Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, and next one we have uh, Bing Bing Yan. Nope. All right. Uh, no worries. We have a bit of, uh, if you're not comfortable sharing, that's perfectly okay. Uh, leaving it all open. Uh, and last we have Sonia. I'm Sonia. I'm from uh, Portugal. I'm a sociologist. Mm -hmm. I'm the chair of socioeconomic inequality SIG, and I'm professor at the University of Lusophono University, mm -hmm. and I work on sociology of sports and physical activity. Brilliant. Thank you. I love that because my bachelor's was in sociology as well, so oh, kind of spirits right here. <laughs> so good to know. Brilliant. And lastly, Antonio. Yep. So I'm, I'm Antonio, I'm here only to support the, 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 the webinar, but I'm the executive director of Pass. So thank you so much, Sumita, for, for doing this and all for organizing this event and also the, uh, the social economic inequalities uh, C, the special interest group for Pass for, for promoting it. And I'm also in Portugal and uh, based at the University of Lusana, so I'm, I'm a colleague from, from Sonia. Uh, and just to finalize, because I do have to go to another meeting, it, it, it's really not a good time for me at this point. So, Laurel, I'll give you the host for the meeting, so it should be able to run the meeting. And when it stops, uh, it should uh, go, everything should be fine. Uh, and Sonia, if you have anything really urgent, please give me a call and I should Thank be able to get back to Thank this you so one. Much. Uh, and I, finally, I noticed that Bing Yang Pang have not ever mentioned something here on the chat. So maybe you can you can learn about him uh, or her in, oh, no in, in, in this in this meeting. So thank yeah. you so much for doing this. And uh, Tony, again, if needed, please give me a call. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, you so much. Bye-bye. Okay. okay. See you. Bye-bye. All righty. So I will get a jump on this. I think um, based on so how how we kind of work at inclusive creation is it's all very customized and what i thought i could share here today is firstly talking about um innovations from around the world and then moving on to a little bit about cultural diversity and how this comes deeply into play when we talk about health and health choices for example and lastly talking about equitable uh, solutions for everybody um so first why is it not working there we go so when we talk about diverse innovations, um, I would love to show you an example of one from my country back home in Singapore. Here you can see um, a classroom. You've got a very nice projected um, AI kind of a driven model on the walls. And this particular innovation, I think um, it costed about 50 grand to run each time. Uh, and essentially what it is, is it's a, it's a visual representation of, the, of, of, of public life and so, social life around um, in, out in public. And this was meant for kids with disabilities. And what this aimed to, to, to achieve was that it gives them a bit of a, a feel for what it's like to be out in public before, uh, before they, they actually face the real world out there. So this is a bit of a simulation. And what you can see here in the foreground, you have uh, kids that are sitting on the ground, kind of looking at this carnival type of a environment around them. And something like this can be very helpful, for example, kids uh, who, who are autistic or kids with, uh, with intellectual disabilities, for example, that might find actual environments out there overly stimulating. And so when we talk about innovations, I think this is what tends to come to mind, right? Something that's very high tech, something that's very fancy, something that's that's really AI driven, machine learning. We have all of these really fancy words going on in our lives these days. Um, but I would also like to like to ask you guys when I when I talk about innovations, what are some innovations that you have come across? For example, everyday lives. What are some innovations? Maybe new techniques. New, new, new what, sorry? New techniques. Techniques, yeah, new techniques, uh, something that gives a new way of, of, of doing things, for example, yeah, for sure. Anything else? What else can be an innovation? New ways of uh, seeing things, of uh, learning things, of studying things, uh, any kind of things. 
Yes, exactly. So innovations, I love that these are the answers you're giving me because very often when I when I ask a group of people these questions, they tell me, oh, your iPhone is an innovation. Um, your TV is an innovation. Something all, always very shiny and metallic and expensive, right? But what if I told you that this is also an innovation? We have here potatoes. And what if I told you potatoes actually had a much, much, much bigger impact um, than that fancy classroom stimulated environment um, that we saw before. Because what is actual innovations? You know, when we think about innovations or innovations within health, it's really important to understand that when we even talk about universal design, there's really no such thing as universal design. There's no such thing that of being universal. Everything is always customized, cultural, environmental, societal, even socioeconomic classes. Everything has to be customized to the people that you're working with, to the to the environments that you're working within. Um, and a second point here, you can see it's just geographic nuancing, even nationally. So, for example, um, even even coming from a country like Singapore, it's tiny. It's one of the tiniest countries in the world. You can go across the island in forty five minutes. It's nothing. But even then, um, we when when I used to have to work in government policies and and projects, for example, within the disability sector you had to consider what each, for example, racial group would identify with. Um, how do stories come into play when you wanna roll out certain policies? How people identify with each other? All of this is also very, very important, even within uh, a similar geography. So just going back to the potato example, um, this is actually a story that, that I came across in my line of work and it absolutely blew me away because this, this happened, I think, probably really about a year ago. And it was a representative from a, a small village in India. They came up to me in uh, my line of work in, at, at one of these con uh, conferences that I was at. And they said, listen, so in our village, um, we tend to have kids that have mobility difficulties to, to with their hands. Um, they can't grip a spoon. They can't learn to grip, um, you know, to practice their, their grip strength. And I said, oh, okay, you know, I, I've heard of these uh, large, you know, large held spoons that, that have been developed in the US, you know, um, I think they're used for trauma patients, for example, I think they're also used for patients that have Parkinson's to, to kind of help the grip. And I think it costs maybe about 100 to $200 per spoon. So this is the cheapest solution that I know of. And the guy said, yes, that's all very well and good, but I think we've actually found a much better solution that only costs about 10 cents per, per, per innovation. And I was like, that doesn't quite seem right. How, how is that possible? And what he showed me was actually this. And this is actually how they taught kids within the village to practice their grip strength. You have a potato and you stick a spoon into it and that helps your grip strength. And as the child grows and as, as his strength changes, as, as he gets older, you can change the size of the potato depending on what you want. And when you're done with the potato, it always makes a great stew. Um, and this is such an innovation that it, it didn't occur to me that something that's available in your everyday lives can be adapted, can be used for something else. And it's something as simple as a potato. And so my takeaway from this thing is that every time we want to think about an innovation or something new way of doing it, let's always think about what is the potato in this situation, right? Let's not always go to the most expensive, fancy, shiny new gadget. It can be as simple as a potato, right? So next one, to, you know, coming back to this whole cultural discussion that we're having, talking about inclusive cultures. Um, this is something that I think a lot of us grew up with, right? The pyramid table. Uh, you guys are all in health. I'm sure this is a very common table that you've come across. It's something I grew up with in Singapore. And this was exactly a table that I learned and you saw all throughout health education classes from eight years old all the way until I was 15 and graduated high school. And it was rather confusing for me because as an Indian person, uh, Singapore is a multicultural country with Indians, Chinese, Malay people with vastly different types of food. It was very confusing for me how I could include um, nuts, seeds, beans and tofu in my daily diet when every day I went home and it was curry, right? I only knew there was curry and rice and maybe vegetables on the side, you get that. But 
how did this translate for me? How do I have cheese? I do not like cheese and living in Vienna, this is a bit of a torture for me, but I never grew up eating cheese. So how do we adapt? And, and this is something that was, was a little, little bit of our research into this. And I think, you know, when we, when we talk about cultural nuancing and, and cultural diversity, we also need to understand that interpersonal identities and this is how we interact with each other within our own social groups versus intrapersonal relationships, which is how we talk within ourselves, how we identify with certain foods, certain uh, measures, certain policies that we come across, what we think about it in our own heads. And these are also important things that I think it's, it's, it's critical to consider. And this is why a very brilliant, a very brilliant um, academic called Old Ways back in 1993 came up with these food pyramids. Um, are you guys aware of, of these food pyramids? I'm sure you must have come across them. No? Okay. I love that I'm able to introduce something new. So these food pyramids introduced in 1993. We have the African Heritage Diet Pyramid, which includes a lot of fish, vegetables. I'll be more than happy to share these slides later, so don't, don't worry about taking a screenshot. Um, beside that, I know the font is a little bit small, but we have the Latin American Diet Pyramid, which is also slightly different when it comes to the proportion of foods that you have. We have the Asian Diet Pyramid, and this is something that I grew up with, and this is something I can identify very strongly with as well. The Mediterranean, Mediterranean, Mediterranean uh, Diet Pyramid, and then the Vegetarian and Vegan Diet Pyramid. And this is really what it's all about. Food is such a huge, huge part of our lives that even something as small as a, as a, as a diet pyramid can impact people's lives. You know, when we talk about them, about making better choices in, in, in day-to-day -day living, making better eating choices, you know, these days, this is the big thing, right? You know, healthy eating and, and making conscious decisions about what you put into your body. And something like this can actually impact uh, the choices that people make just because they don't, they can't identify or they don't even recognize the types of food that's on a normal food pyramid. And the one in the past that was pretty much based on a very westernized diet, um, with a lot of cheese, nuts, grains, breads, things like this. Whereas here you can see um, a lot more, for example, the Asian diet pyramid, you even have in the corner, you have drink water and tea. I grew up with tea all the time. So it's something as small as this that really, really makes a difference to somebody. And when I saw this, then I, I, I found this out a couple of years ago, I was like, oh, this makes so much more sense to me rather than the diet pyramid that I saw before. So cultural nuancing is goes even to the little depths of how we interact with food, for example, how we interact with um, what we're familiar with. There's always this very um, similar anecdote, and I'm just going to throw this out there, was that um, back in the days, I think this was maybe in the early 90s, maybe late 80s, early 90s, um, it was when the UN was giving a lot of food aid to Africa. And um, I don't know how many of you know this story, but they brought a lot of, um, sorry, they brought a lot of um, these types of food, you know, canned, uh, canned vegetables, a lot of um, uh, biscuits, for example. They brought a lot of food that would last a long time and is much needed in a, in a, in a, a developing economy like Africa where you need food to stay a long time. But the African community just could not, they could not identify with it. They would rather go hungry than eat something that was so unfamiliar to them or so unusual to them. So even when it comes to something as small as food can truly impact policy level decisions. Um, so that's, that's, that's one thing. And moving on to a little bit, when we talk about, you know, treating people equally, I'm sorry if I'm rushing through this a bit. So if you have any questions, feel free to jump through. I'm just trying to make sure we stick to time. Um, but when we talk about equality and, and, and treating people equally, this is also something that's rather important. Here we can see three three different, um, it's a football game for those of you who, who are having uh, issues try, trying to understand what it is. In the first column, we say equality, right? There's a fence, everyone is given an equal wooden box and you can see the last kid in there, even though he's given the same thing as everybody else, he still can't access the game. Right, but this is treating everyone equally. It's it's fair, but outcomes are not fair, right? And this is where we move to the second point, and that that's why it says equity, right? Everyone gets the supports that they need to have equal access to certain things, and this means one person might be given a wooden box, some people might be given two boxes, some people might not even need boxes, right? 
Um, and this is where the idea of, for example, affirmative action also comes across. Um, everyone is given the support they need based on background, uh, background circumstances, societal circumstances, family circumstances, all of these things need to be taken into account as well. So this means going back even sometimes generationally to really understand what, um, what options this person has today in, 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 this, in this lifetime that they have. And lastly, you can see justice. And this is a rather interesting aspect for me. So in the first two pictures, we have a wooden fence that really keeps people out and keeps people divided away from the football game. But justice is really when you have inequity that is addressed because it's important to ensure that the systemic barrier that has been built, that has always been there, there's absolutely no reason to have a fence around a football game. No one is rushing the field. No one is, 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 is affecting the game. Why is there a wooden fence? Because it's always been there. It's always been the answer, right? Because that's how it's always been done. Um, and this is something that we definitely need to break through. I know it's not easy, especially when it comes to healthcare work. These things take years, for example. But working towards having that systemic barrier removed is really the highest level of, of, of justice that we, can, that we can work towards and hope for. And this means that all three people, they do not need special accommodations. They do not need special equity, uh, affirmative action, uh, uh, affirmative actions, because without supports and accommodations, they can still access what they need to get to, which is the football game. And yet there is a way that this fence is being built, this chain link fence, you're still protecting the game. So there are, there are ways around protecting certain things that need to be protected, but yet also allowing people greater access without really costing too much when it comes to providing them with uh, required required um, features that, that they might need to use to access certain, certain policies, for example, or certain uh, programs, for example. So I also wanna urge you guys to keep in mind when we talk about equality, equity, and justice, these three things go hand in hand. What is equal might not always be what's equitable and what's equitable might not always be what's just and right. Right. So these are the three levels that I would really urge you all to think about things when you come across a certain policy that's being introduced. Who is it impacting? How is it impacting? Is this something that can be um, amended without losing the essence of what the policy is about? And this is where also universal design comes uh, comes into play. And this is understanding the impact that universal design has within communities and societies. When you design universally, it's, I don't mean you design for everybody. I mean that the design that you create should be more, more or less applicable to certain groups that you have identified within your studies as well. Not everything is a numbers game. I know a lot of times when I added this point here because a lot of times people come to me and say, yeah, it's all very well and good, but it's all very expensive. And I understand this. And, and just like I go back to the potato example, right? Not everything has to cost 50 grand to run at a time. There are easier options out there. There are simpler options out there. All we have to do is know where to look. And this means either looking to different geographies that might have um, very low bars for, for tech innovations or low barriers for infrastructural innovations and really understanding what we can do to adapt and, and, and complement the work that we have uh, within our, our own societies as well. And another point here is long-term planning versus empathy. Um, empathy is something that I think is a very hard um, point to grasp and point to understand. You can understand somebody. You can understand the challenges that they're going through. You can. But empathizing with them, I think, only really quite really happens when something impacts us personally. And I think this is a normal thing. We are all humans. Things we – even when we talk about disabilities, right, um, – Every one of us somehow knows someone with a disability, has come into contact with someone with a disability. I don't mean physical, I mean all sorts of disabilities. And disability is such a huge, huge point in today's world. It's up to 15% of the world's uh, global population. And yet it's 15% that's being ignored at every single turn, unless it comes to healthcare, because it eventually everyone gets a disability because either they acquire it or through aging or something like that. But in every other policy matter, disability is left to the last instance, whether it comes to business, profits, accessibility, uh, tourism, for example, disability is left to the last choice. And only when there's a big stink about it and then people start looking into it. But 
this is where I really um, would like to push more healthcare professionals or push further people. When we come into groups that deal with disability, um, empathizing with them doesn't only mean including them in our research at a very, at, you know, at some stage. It's about even putting the research in their hands to see where it leads to, for example. And I think this is something that is takes a bit of practice and definitely does take a little bit of work. But this sort of um, involved research processes can yield such incredible results. And this means getting information that to questions you might not even have thought of, for example. Um, one way that we used to do it back in back when I was doing policy work was that we would train a group of people with disabilities, cross disability, intellectual, dis uh, intellectual, physical, invisible, all sorts of disabilities, um, train them on putting things down in a way that also does make sense qualitatively and also quantitatively. But what we did was essentially give them diaries where they could go home and write their own experiences about their day. And this is also where we need to put in a little bit of work because when they came back to us at the end of the week, sussing out certain things uh, that was written down was also, it took so much work, but then it also gave us such incredible insight into how their day-to-day -day lives was. So for example, um, I had, I was working with with a young, young teenage boy who, who was autistic. Um, and all he would write in his diary was about football. That is all he would write in his diary. And this was the research about um, emergency evacuation pathways in, in Singapore. So really football and emergency evacuation, couldn't really understand it. But the work that I had to put in to really understand why he was only talking about football was because that was his language of communication. Um, he spoke about watching football games with in at home or in Singapore, you can also watch football games in some cafes, for example, in the public. And he would always talk about watching football game, games at home. And it begged the question, why was it always at home, right? What was in the cafe that wasn't adaptable for him? Why did he not go outside to watch football with his friends? It's a very, communi uh, very community-based kind of activity. Why was he always only at home? And this also translated to information about how much time he spent at home, um, who else was in his home, um, when he was usually awake, when did he go to bed? You know, a lot of these things does come into play. So there are a lot of these qualitative information out there that you can extract from someone that really just talks about football. So that's really what I want to talk about when we, but that's also what I want to refer when we talk about empathy, for example. And profits versus needs, this also goes back to the, to my initial point of not everything being a numbers game. Um, I know it's very easy for me to say that, oh, we shouldn't think about profits, we should just think about needs because I'm not the one who's applying for grants and things like that. But in the, 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 the reason I say profits versus needs is because what I think about is profits tend to be very short term. It's a very short term outcome that comes from uh, certain programs, whereas needs is a much longer term solution and a longer term idea. An example of this is for example, uh, when we have a shopping mall, right? The, you have steps leading up to the shopping mall, that's great. Everyone can go in there except for people who are using wheelchairs, people who are pushing prams, tourists with, with luggage trolleys, um, all the persons who can't climb steps. You, you start to see what I mean. Profits will be there, the mall will always make money, but you're probably gonna have to spend a little bit more right now to build a ramp so that these groups of people that have eventually been left out can also go in there and spend money. In the long term, it does make much, much more sense to include them within your planning as well. So with this, I just wanna, I just wanna also kind of uh, do a bit of a wrap up before we, we move on a little bit to the activity is that firstly, we talk about you know, innovations. It's innovations within a certain environmental context, cultural context talking about diverse cultures, we also think about how something as small as food, something as small as storytelling does impact people's lives and how they adapt to certain things. And in the third one, equality, equitability, equitability and justice can impact how people um, are affected by certain policies, for example. So these are sort of the three things I'll, uh, I just want to share with you. Um, this is a great infographic that I came across. Um, first one, you have diversity, where you recognize how people are different. That's great. 
But then we have equity, where you have fair treatment, access, opportunity, and advancement, so everyone is treated equitably. But then what you really want is full inclusion, where you have a variety of people who have a power, this is the important point, and a voice as part of the decision-making authority. People need to have their say in how they would like healthcare to be adapted for them. They would, they should have a say in how certain emergency evacuation policy should uh, would affect them because they are the ones that will eventually live it when it comes down to crunch time, right? So with that, I, want, I just want to say thank you uh, and open the floor to any questions that you might have. I will link through to my email here. So if you have any questions um, that come up to you in the middle of the night, three days from now, feel free to drop me an email. Happy to answer them. Um, but for now, opening up the floor to any comments you might have, any thoughts you might have, any any critiques that you might have, even that will be that's what I'm open for. No, was I that brilliant? That's that's really quite good. Thank you. Can I start, Laurel? Yes, please. Yes, please. I'm trying to figure out how I can stop sharing the screen so I can see all of you again. It's been weird talking to myself. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm back. Can I start, Laurel? Thank you. Uh, Sumita, um, I have a question for mm. you uh, related with the knowledge that you have okay. regarding your master in sociology. <laughs> <laughs> I'm oh, it's going to be an exam question, isn't it? This one, I can feel it. <laughs> I think, I think he, 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 it's very important for us to, mm -hmm. to try to understand how can you uh, mingle the knowledge that you have in sociology. I'm, so, I, I'm also a sociologist, so I can yeah. understand the things you learn with your master. Mm -hmm. uh, with the social inclusion with uh, socioeconomic uh, inequalities. Mm -hmm. I work on gender and also on social inclusion. So I'm very interested to hear you more about the, the, uh, the bridges that you can build relating all these uh, three things. Can you do sure, that? Sure, um, <laughs> I love that you're working with gender because that's really what I looked into when I was doing my, my, my sociology thing as well. So I'm feeling this. Um, yeah, but I've always known people with, with, with a background like sociology, for example, it's very, very easy to really take a certain thread and tie it into something else. And what I mean by this is, for example, my master's work that I did in sociology um, focused a lot on, I knew I wanted to focus on policy work, on gender. And um, so there's a little bit more about me as well. So back when I was doing my master's, um, when I was 21, um, I was in the, involved in this thing called military. So I was very much in, interested in military structures, which is a very masculine institution. We can all agree to that. Even, even today, anywhere in the world, it's a very masculine institution. No, de don't, no denial about that. Um, but what I wanted to do and how I ten tended to marry both in, in this interest, interested field that I had, which was the military, was looking into, for example, um, policies that came to the military, specifically when it came to the US military and the Singapore military, because um, there were certain sections or certain departments that women were not permitted into because they said uh, it could affect your body, could affect your health for certain reasons. Um, the US military is, is, has made progress on this front, but what I was specifically looking towards is why do we need to have such a masculine military in this day and age, right? Um, maybe back 200 years ago, sure, it made sense. You need brute strength. I mean, as, as equal as men and women are within societies, physical strength is something that I think we can all agree. It's, it's, it tends to favor more towards the, the, the male perspective. Um, so 200 years ago, sure, you needed brute strength to go out and club someone over the head and take over their land. That made sense to me. But in this day and age, when we have... Um, for example, uh, drones, you know, you have uh, this, this asymmetrical warfare, which is what, what, what I was working on as well, and very distance warfare. Very, it's a very rare situation other than ground troops where you actually go into the land and fight on the ground. Very rare. A lot of times what happens is you send in the Air Force, you send in the Navy, and you mortar the country and bomb them into bits. So there really is no reason for 
the military is to be so masculine in this day and age. And research and studies have also shown that women do exceptionally better than men uh, and can also track six times more than men actually can on a certain a map. So it really does make more sense for women to be running a lot of things in the military these days. And that's really what I was looking at. Um, so when it comes to sociology and gender and things like this, this really was, was the interest that, that I, I, I developed. Um, and I would say when it comes to looking into gender, another aspect that we should also look into would be, for example, socioeconomic class, because this is very, very intricately tied, I feel. Um, it's something that I've learned to understand over the years of working within the field. Because, for example, you know, um, if, if you go to a rural community in India, right, um, women tend to have the more homemaking role, um, whereas men tend to go out, work, bring in the field, uh, bring in the field, bring in the food, bring in the income um, and things like that. And it's also frowned upon by society when a woman chooses to, to empower herself to go out and be the breadwinner of the family. So I think socioeconomic class and culture is also very much intricately tied with gender and how we even identify ourselves as male, female, feminine, masculine, things like this. Um, so when, when we talk about you know, things like intersectionalities, it's so intricately tied that I feel like it's really hard to just talk about gender without really touching on everything else. Um, I mean, the, the reason I went into the military was because I thought, oh, I need someone to pay for my university education. I can't afford it. And it, that's how this entire thing was born. So um, sociology, I think, is this lovely little web that ties a lot of things together really beautifully. And it's why it's always been my first love. Um, so, yes, I, ho I hope that answered your question. I know I rambled on a bit, but um, I can go on talking for hours about sociology so I hope that did answer your question somehow um, and that there was some wisdom somewhere in there so thank yeah. you so much you talk about uh, social economic uh, social inequalities so and social inequalities are fully related with social economic inequalities also so absolutely thank you so much for your answer no worries thank you um any other questions Mary Nikita anyone else no. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking maybe a whole different question, but mm -hmm. in our research group, we try to, you talked about participation, and in our research group, we try to include the target population as much as possible in the research, mm -hmm. but what we notice is that this group is difficult to reach, yeah. and that response rates are very low, or they drop out early, and I was wondering if you, maybe one of you have any experience in yeah, experience with inclusive research participation and um, yeah, maybe also ways to prevent them from dropping out or stopping early. Sure. Because there there are some things known, but they do not really work all the time in real life settings. So yeah, um, it's a fantastic question, and it's something that. Um, I'm going to do my best to explain without really understanding the particular group that you're, that you're referring to, for example. So I'll give you a few examples. Um, I know very often when, when, when it comes to research, the ideal outcome for us when we do participatory research is to have things written down and handed back to us. That's the easiest thing. Or putting it a survey on a piece of paper and ran, ranking it from one to 10 and doing a quantitative research. That's an ideal situation. But for example, I think there was a situation that uh, we were conducting research on kids with disabilities, not on them, but with them, um, for kids with disabilities. And we realized that there's no way, no chance in hell that we could ask them to write their thoughts, write their feelings and give it back to us. Because that would cause one of two things. Either they'll get bored and drop out. They don't even like doing schoolwork. Why would, give, why would we give them more work? But secondly, it's very hard to also vocalize certain emotions. I mean, I'm 35 and even till today, I still don't know how I feel until I actually sit down and force myself to think about these things. Um, and so one option that we did was uh, we gave them a sticker, sort of a sticker pad, like a sticker book. And it had the days of from like Monday to Friday, uh, 1st of January till 30, 31st, for example. And we gave them three different stickers. So one had like a smiley face, one had like a sad face, and one had like a neutral sort of face, or one had like a star, for example. So we had given them these four stickers. 
And all they had to do was just paste a sticker on how they felt at the time when they were pasting the sticker. And this was more of, uh, you know, trying to figure out how they felt about school and, and inclusive education. And it was a part of a whole other thing. But that's one way that, that, that we thought worked pretty well for us because it's fun, it's shiny, it's lovely, and it takes two seconds. You don't really have to think about it. And instinctively, when you have four stickers with a star, smiley face, frown, or whatever it is, you just pick the one that identifies with you. It's, it's instinctive. Um, and I think this is something that we need to keep in mind when we do participatory research as well, is go for the lowest hanging fruit a lot of times when it comes to research, I think with academics, we tend to find the most complicated and not the most, not the easiest way of doing things because we've been in the field for so long, right? Um, but sometimes it's just about going back to stickers and pink stickers if you're happy or a blue one if you're sad. Um, and through this, it also creates a conversation. So I think a lot of times when you work with kids, for example, or you work with people with disabilities, intellectual disabilities, um, it's also about making things fun. And through play and through interaction, you can actually get so much more out of it. It does take more time for sure. Yes, I agree. But um, I think the output far, far outweighs the input. And there's lots of different things that you can do with the output as well. So that's just my take, but I'm happy to hear more from Mary and Sonia as well, whom I'm sure have, have a bit of insight into this as well. And, and Laurel, sorry, I didn't forget you. So Nikita, I'd like to know a little bit more about the study population and, um, and yeah, I guess, and, and the type of assessment you're doing. I have some thoughts, but I wanna make sure I understand what your, what your particular issue is. Yeah. Well, for our research department, I think it's really diverse. We have a lot of target populations and a lot of study designs. But for my study now, um, I'm doing qualitative research, uh, which exists of interviews. And uh, my target populations are people with a migration background, uh, diverse by uh, migration backgrounds. And now I am lucky that I can work from a, a, another study which already has a database so I can call the people and ask them if they want to participate and they already uh, are, participa are participating in that other study so it's a little bit easier but for example before um, yeah, I did a study on HPV vaccination and cervical cancer screening and therefore we needed to recruit um, parents of young children to get their opinion about yeah, in the Netherlands, they maybe want to uh, extend the cervical cancer screening interval for people who are vaccinated. And we wanted to get their opinion yeah, on that matter. So yeah, it could be really diverse, but for now I'm mostly focusing on people with a migration background. Well, um, thanks for that. Sounds like interesting work. So with the migration background, um, my, they're still transitioning, probably. Um, there's still some movement. No, not so much. They, they're stable. Some of them are. Yeah, you have first and second generation in Amsterdam. Mostly in Amsterdam, almost 60% of the population uh, has a migration background. So you have the first generation, second generation, and there are even four generations right now. Um, okay. So they could be really adjusted, but they could also be, um, yeah, in the kind of transition to get to know the healthcare system, for example. So that's also really diverse. Yeah. So, you know, I think one of the things that I'm really interested in is um, building com strong community partnerships and then using those trusted relationships to help with recruitment and retention. And maybe you're already doing that. What I've found through community partners, they've really helped a lot with things like um, some of the things Samita was talking about, but also like language and how you approach the assessments and how you, um, like what is needed in order for participation to happen. Um, so we've provided, you know, food and daycare and transportation vouchers, that, you know, like all of these different supports and having the data collection happen in a place that's also a trusted space. Um, and that is doesn't always work great. Um, I don't know, are you going through health providers, health clinics? 
Um, well, now I'm just um, getting more participants from the other study, which already oh, exists yeah. and has the database. But the things you are saying, I give them the option to do the interview online at the hospital and also I can come at their home. Mm -hmm. So that makes it a lot easier. And I also make sure that their transportation costs are covered and um, I bring cookies. <laughs> so yeah that's it yeah 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 well you're really I think you're really asking the million dollar question um you know how how does retention happen so you know thinking from an equity inclusion justice perspective you know you do everything that you can in order to provide whatever it is that is needed for them to be able to participate but then you know life still happens yeah. and research isn't their priority you know their priority is getting out of bed in the morning and taking care of the family, you know, whatever it is. So um, sounds like you're doing the right things and just uh, don't give up, I guess. Thank you. And that's exactly why I asked the question, because we talk a lot about this in our research departments. And I think I have a lot of ways uh, which I can inc include in my research, but I never talked to anybody about my uh, institution about this and mm -hmm. we're all from different countries so mm -hmm. I thought maybe you are doing something else um, maybe another method that I don't know yet but um, it is good to know that I am on the right way <laughs> thank you mm -hmm. okay. certainly for longitudinal follow-up studies where I mean you're drawing from another study um, but frequent touch points you know like send out a birthday card or send out a, you know, yeah. hey, I think you might find this interesting or invite them to other events, like hold a, I don't know, continuing education around growing tomatoes or, you know, whatever it is. To yeah, management. That's, that's also a really nice idea. What I've noticed is that they give like an update on their research, research results every three months, I think. And, um, yeah, but I also spoke uh, a participant today who said that they didn't refer any of her results back to her. So the, that she was a little bit done with the research group. Mm. So, yeah, I think it's uh, a give and take situation yeah. or something like that. Yeah, you also, they do something for you and you need to be, show a little bit of empathy, thoughtfulness and yeah, just try to do what you get, what you would like to receive as well if you were a participant. Yeah. Right. One of our community partners, and this is my last comment, <laughs> um, um, will say, so what are my what are the participants getting out of it? You know, it's more than the incentive, it's more than that. So how can you leverage this opportunity to then provide something maybe that the community needs or something? So that's another. yeah, exactly. Yeah, great. Thank you. <laughs> Um, if, if I could just mm -hmm. add a couple of comments. It, it just came to mind when, when Maria was mentioning it. And uh, this was a research that a friend of mine was involved in. So in Singapore, we have a very large migrant worker community. And um, when they were doing a, a bit of research about, you know, um, whether they were being fairly treated by the employers, things like this, um, it, it's it's in the devil's in the details, right? So it's in the small things. And what they found out was very often the did this research conversations. I mean, they, they brought food, they did everything. They, they even spoke in the same language, for example. But the challenge lay in the fact that um, a lot of these research things was done over sitting at the ch on a chair across a table and writing things down. And someone, one, some one of one of the one of the team members had a bright idea because a lot of these migrant communities they came from Bangladesh, India, for example, where people are used to sitting on the floor, on on cloth mats, for example. And yeah. something as small as this. And when they found out, and one day they decided, you know what, let's just sit on the floor, cross our legs, sit on the floor, food's on the floor. That, that's that's how they eat at home, right? That's how we eat at home. Um, it took the conversation to a whole other level. So it's, it's something as small as that could even play a huge part when we, when we talk about, you know, migrant communities, for example. Um, and even just talking about my own experience, you know, moving to Vienna from Singapore, one of the hugely, hugely impactful things, and this... I always point this out to people when when I when I when they ask me, you know, why did you, you know, why did you choose to stay in a country where you don't speak a language? German's not easy to to, to learn. Um, I don't look like everyone else around me. 
Um, and yet I've been here for three years and it's one of the most fantastic places I've been in. It's because on my very first day in the office, um, my colleagues came up to me. We had a, we had a, a round table meeting and the first question that they asked me was, firstly, how do we pronounce your last name so that we can pronounce it correctly? No one had ever asked me this in my entire time in Singapore. And that's the place I was born in. Um, and secondly, they asked me, do you have a preferred um, name that you would like to use? Because a lot of times in, in Indian communities, it's very rare that someone calls me Sumita. Like, it's really weird even for me to say it and hear it. Everyone calls me Su. Like, that mm. is it. And so when someone calls me Sumita, automatically inside, I'm just like, Ugh. like I don't like, like, it's just weird for me because I don't, I'm not used to hearing it. So maybe even asking small questions like how they would like to be preferred to be called or, you know, do they have a pet name that they would like to be that they would like to use. A lot of migrant communities have these sort of informal um, informal names that, that friends or family use around them. And this helps really to lower their guards a little bit more. So those are just two things that I thought I should throw out there and could be helpful. So Yeah, very nice. Thanks. I also thought of a really nice example they did at my research department. They also do a lot of things about getting to move people more and about more of a healthy lifestyle and they also targeted uh, people from India and they found out that sport classes weren't re really working so they <laughs> so they um yeah they planned like Bollywood dancing classes and yeah. the part participation rate was so high afterwards and now yeah. they're still doing that in Amsterdam and it's a really nice community thing everybody from the neighborhood is coming there so I think it's something that came up in mind but that's also a really nice example of tailoring some things exactly. to yeah yeah brilliant. thank you thank also, you uh, Nikita also preparing meals together mm. it's very important to think about these uh, little topics that are fully related with their culture. I worked on a, on a project, uh, it names uh, SoCare, uh, new, kind of, new Kinds of Social Care, and we worked also with migrant families. And mm -hmm. one thing that we have done, it was on 2003, so 20 years ago. Um, we, want, we, want, we went to the neighborhood and we, we, we didn't come to the community and say, we, we want you sh to show you what we know. We want, no, we said, we want to learn from you. We want mm -hmm. to be with you. We want to, to prepare meals with you. We want to share uh, um, our knowledge, but we need to know more about you. We need to, we need to, we need for we need that you think that we are your neighbor also and it was outstanding it was marvelous we learned a lot from them um, our report was fully uh, talked about because here in Portugal, we have um, a great community from Angola. Mm -hmm. So it was very important for also for our uh, researchers community, but also for our community itself, our social community to know more about them. And it was great. It was very, very good. And nowadays I think about it and I thought, well, we start a movement <laughs> like something that is a, a participatory movement, uh, uh, building bridges between researchers and community. And it was fantastic. And um, this, it, this was very important for us to know how to reach out certain kinds of communities, certain kinds of social groups. So, um, I think he, you can start from meals <laughs> because we are sitting at the table and we talk about life and we talk about our kids and we talk about everything. Uh, and it's very warm to see that we are family. All, all together, we are a family. It, it was very good and um, please do it. <laughs>
sounds mm. like such a sounds like such a nice experience yeah yeah i was i don't know if i can add a little thing i don't know okay. with the time but uh oh, yeah we have just a couple of minutes um we're just a little couple minutes over so we'll wrap it up after your statement yeah okay yeah. thanks <laughs> yeah so in the netherlands they are doing a lot of research on the migrant groups which mm -hmm. the biggest migrant groups in the netherlands are people from morocco turkey and suriname and um yeah, they also have all these kinds of symposiums with new test results. And there we talked a lot about what to do with the results because the results are most, for example, that people with a Suriname background have more chance at diabetes or something like that. So most of the time it's a little bit negative, like they mm -hmm. don't eat as healthy as people who are born in the Netherlands. And then we thought about how can we change that perspective and we came up, yeah, it, it already exists, but we came up, uh, we thought of using the, I don't know if you know it, but it's the positive deviance approach. Um, yeah, we, that we needed to use that more in research and especially with mm -hmm. the more vulnerable groups who, yeah, sadly, mostly are people with a migration background. So I really hope to include that in my, um, in my current research as well, just to look at the yeah. positive things and look in a community where things go right and see how they can learn from each other instead of, um, for example, learn from me who grow up with a lot of cheese in the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's different, but yeah. yeah, that's one thing I would like to add, thanks. Well, yeah, of course. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, in the spirit of wrapping up, um, I think Serena provided her email. Um, mm -hmm. We all have LinkedIn, so feel welcome to connect with each other if you're not connected, um, just to continue the conversation. Um, Sumira, on behalf of Ispanpa, thank you very much for being right. here and thank joining you. us. Great, nice, cozy group. So happy to have been here. Thank you. Yeah, great. Well, have a great day, everyone, or great rest of your day, whichever country you are in at the moment. Um, and we look forward to continuing the conversation later. And Thank you very much, care, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>